Okay, good morning everybody. Um, this is our sixth lecture. And as you can see, uh, <laughs> we sort of switching to something else entirely now. Uh, there will also be no recap today, um, basically because what we have been doing last time was uh, an extension of what we did the time prior to our last lecture and uh, we have talked about this extensively already. Uh, today I um, will first have a look at a couple of images after all. This is a lecture on image processing and then I'll switch to the whiteboard, do something else than we see on these uh, slides and then I'll get back to the slides. It's just because otherwise I would have to move the whiteboard back and forth. Let's not do that. So, what are binary images and shapes? Here are some. Uh, what do we see here? What is this? Person. Uh, what is this? And what about uh, this? How do you know this? <laughs> Think of it. It's, it's amazing. Like, what is this? Why is this a dog and this a cat? How, how is your brain able to do that? Uh, this, this is, uh, is a miracle. Right? If we could understand that, and of course, you know, people work in towards understanding how the brain processes uh, visual input, uh, it appears that shapes are very strong cues as to objects. Right? I mean, these, these are highly stylized cats. This, typically a cat would have eyes, it would have a, um, a certain pattern for the coat. We, we don't see that here. And still we can say, this is a cat and this is a dog. And, and this has sort of four legs and this has four legs. And still we see the difference. Um, we do not yet entirely know how, how that works. Um, and actually, <laughs> here is the downer. We will not really look into how you know, we can work with, uh, with shape images for the purpose of object recognition. I am just showing those to you because um, we are interested in the kind of functions that we can use to understand or think about shape images. Right? In particular, uh, these are all binary images. They, they have a certain extension, I mean, like so. Right? Uh, there is a size of that image, but the colors of the pixels in that image or in those images are just two. Pixel is either white or it is black. In that sense, we call these shape images binary images. And we can think of these binary images in terms of functions as we are used to by now. Uh, these are binary images that map certain coordinates in the image plane well, to the set consisting of just two elements, 0 or 1. And we say that this function assumes a value of 1 if the corresponding coordinate is a foreground pixel and a value of 0 if it is a background pixel. Now this is strange because um, so far we always said black is 0 and white is 255. Well, you know, we can, we can um, if actually if you store such an image you know, in the memory of your computer or write it to disk, um, you may actually really store it as a binary um, data file, or uh, you could, you know, read a gray value image containing just two gray values, white and black, and then compute uh, 255 um, divided by, no, uh, the number, uh, whatever, the, um, uh, you can have, uh, now I'm, I'm getting confused here. But you can turn these gray value images into binary images. I'll show you the transformation next time. Right. So there's no problem. Conceptually, we can think of them like that. And um, 
Again, the difference is that the foreground pixels are the black ones now. What I really need, and this is why I'm showing you these images at, at the beginning of today's lecture, is the fact that we can think of functions like that, like this, as indicator functions. And indicator functions played a certain role in our last semester on image processing. And here, consider this. Say we were given a set consisting of two dimensional points, x1 up to xn. So that is to say each of these two dimensional vectors consists of two entries, uh, an x entry and a y entry. And the function I defined here could also be defined with respect to such a set. We could say um, for any x this function assumes a value of 1 if that x is in the set, otherwise it assumes a value of 0. Here is yet another funny way of how we may think of it. We may think of it as a superposition of lots of delta functions. Uh, the delta function is an old friend of ours. We discussed it extensively in the uh, last semester. Uh, once again, what I need here is the fact that we can think of the image function as an indicator function. So let's be clear about this. Here, we say there is a function that takes two coordinate values and maps them to either 0 or 1, depending on whether the coordinate indicates a background or foreground pixel. So, I don't know, these coordinates here would all be mapped to 0 because it's a background pixel and the shape is the foreground object. Right? So all these coordinates would be mapped to 1. We can, however, think about this shape as a collection of lots of points. Right? So instead of sort of thinking of it as an image function, we could also think of it as a collection of two-dimensional points. And given that collection of points, we can create an image simply by setting all the pixels in the image to the background that are not contained in the set of points we are given. And all the points in, this, in the set that we are given would be indicated in this image in terms of the black pixel. And this idea of indicator functions uh, will come in very handy once we begin studying the following problem. I am showing you uh, what is this? A horse, yeah. So this is the shape of a horse. Um, and if it is somehow shown in an orientation, you would not find a horse oriented in, in nature. Right? And so I, I could have chosen anything here. The question is, is there something we can do that would, let's call it normalize already, the location and orientation of such shapes? In particular, if all these black pixels are given with respect to this coordinate system, our question could be, is there another coordinate system, a coordinate system that is intrinsic to the shape, and I'm showing it here already, and if we could compute such a coordinate system depending on the shape, that is depending on the set of 2D vectors we are given, we may then express the shape or the set of pixels or 2D points we are given in terms of that coordinate system. And this has uh, tremendous practical value even in, in the case of binary image processing. For instance, um, imagine a um, some plant that produces certain mechanical parts with are you know running over a conveyor belt to the next station where they are further processed and there is a camera mounted on top of the conveyor belt monitoring all the parts and trying to to determine if some of them are faulty or not so visual quality control in, in production 
Um, and and this, is, this is a fairly common setting. And what they typically do is actually, you know, the images, the camera records of the objects moving below on the conveyor belt are turned into shape images. And then they have certain ways of processing those shapes to figure out if everything is okay with that part or not. But, you know, the orientation of these things may be arbitrary, distorted. They are thrown on the belt and are oriented or positioned more or less arbitrarily. So therefore it would be good if, you know, given such an image of such a mechanical part that is to be controlled for, for faults or not, if you could somehow normalize the content of that image such that all the parts under the camera sort of in the normalized images have the same orientation and location. So this, this is one example of where, where this is needed. And we will spend uh, quite some time on the problem of figuring out how to do that. And I start with binary image processing or the example of binary image processing because there it is fairly easy to appreciate and we will then extend it towards much higher dimensional vector spaces. All right, so this is our motivation for what is going to come today and uh, next time and so on and so forth. And now I will switch to the whiteboard and talk about something else. It's basically owing to the way the facilities are set up here. <coughs> Um, because I felt I should widen our context a bit. Um, and by that I mean I wanted to point out something about the philosophy of model fitting. Uh, model fitting. You know, this is what we did of times already. Uh, the last two lectures we looked at the problem of um, fitting an illumination model to an image, finding, I don't know, a model that would be a good indicator of the global illumination conditions in that image. And once we had determined that model, we would sort of subtract it from the image to get uh, a new image that only contains reflectance information and therefore is, uh, is not so much affected by varying illumination. Right? That was an example of model fitting and um, I, I want to talk about model fitting in general for like 10 minutes. So uh, what is this? In, in general we can say given a collection of data. collection of data. And um, by data I mean I mean almost anything. In our case um, the data may be pixels just as we saw for those binary images, for those shape images which we can understand as a set of 2D points. So maybe pixels. Um, the data may actually be a collection of images, oh, images, right. we'll look into that quite extensively later on, um, but of course it may be something that has nothing to do with the content of our lecture such as say stock market indicators, stock market indicators. and so on and so forth. So data is, is a fairly general concept. If we are given data, we may want to, we may want to reduce storage space. Storage space. A fancy word for that is compression. We want to compress uh, we may also want to reduce noise. No. 
place. Um, that is to say, uh, we want to extract, extract or emphasize, extract or emphasize uh, important aspects. Important aspects of the data, or finally, we want to may want to characterize characterize general properties or general properties. Now. These are different goals we may have in mind. If we think of it, they're all the same. Um, if we were able to identify, I don't know, a general underlying trend in, uh, say, a stock market curve, we would not have to store each data point individually, but if we were able to come up with a functional description of the stock market curve, we might actually just store that functional description of the stock market curve. And that would, of course, typically reduce the amount of storage we need. So these two things are the same. But if I say we want to reduce noise, that is basically to say, again with respect to the example of the stock market curve, well, we are not so much interested in the micro behavior, but in the macro behavior of the curve. So in the general behavior, but this is we want to generalize or, or characterize general problems. So it's all the same. But the, the application we may have in mind can be um, different, or there might be different goals we actually have in mind when trying to model a collection of data, but in the end, it's all the same. Now, how do we do that? Um, how would we approach these three goals we could have? The typical approach is typical approach is to assume a very strong word here, assume a parameterized parameterized function function that Planes. Um, that is to say, has generated, has generated the data. The data. Um, I'll emphasize this assume here and continue with um, this function uh, or model. So this is actually this function that we assume is what is called the model in model fitting. Maybe, maybe a geometric or probabilistic or probabilistic These two terms I am rather close to what we study in this, in this lecture on image analysis. Um, of course, may also be other, other functions or models, but those are the ones most interesting to us. And once we have assumed such a model, we then learn, learn or determine Determine the model parameters, model parameters. 
parameters from the given data. From the given data. So, and nothing of this is new to you because this is actually what we have been doing uh, a couple of times already. The first time we did that was when we um, looked at how to quantize photon counts into um, reduced number of gray values, gray levels. Uh, that was when we studied this Lloyd Max algorithm. Now you might want to say, well, what was the model there? Our idea was to say, well, you know, if we were a CCD ship of a camera and photons would hit our elements and then we would be tasked with the, with the problem of sort of assigning the amount of photons uh, to a gray value, uh, we could run this clustering algorithm and there was the model. Right, because we assumed that uh, it's a good idea to subdivide it into certain intervals and to look at uh, the distributions within these intervals and to go for the mean and so on and so forth. So there actually was a model, even though it was not really explicit. But we had a computa computational recipe to determine a couple of parameters. Right? So this is what we did there. Or last time when we fitted the illumination models uh, to to images, we say, okay, let's, let's assume it was a linear function, or let's assume it was a bilinear function, and under this assumption, we then, you know, looked at the image and determined the parameters. So sometimes the models are very explicit, we say, let's assume it's a linear model. Sometimes they are not so explicit, mm. or we, we don't really think about that, right? We just, you know, come up with an algorithm that does something we consider to be useful. We have to determine certain parameters. Oh, there's a model there. Nothing is new here. And the only reason why I am mentioning again and talk about it today is the potential danger um, that may have been building up in your heads <laughs> up until now. Uh, because we you know, did it without consideration, uh, I have to, to point out something. This is why I mention all of this. There is a caveat. And that is to say, a model can fit perfectly, perfectly, but may still be a bad explanation. So this this is this is the message I wanted to hammer home today. And let me therefore underline it. That's the message I wanted to hit home. Now, what could I possibly mean by that? And here the picture says a thousand words. Let me, let me give you two examples. Uh, the first one could be with respect to the kind of binary images we just had a look at. And I will, you know, draw a binary shape. So please think of this as a shape, even though it's just a, a boundary. Um, say, this, this is a collection of like lots and lots of points in here we are given. And you know, it has too many points. We don't want to store so much information. We somehow want to compress this. Isn't there a function that would describe this? Um, and so let me you know, draw a coordinate system like so, say x and y. Um, is there a function that would describe it? Well, you know, we have been using linear models quite extensively so far, so let's you know, maybe 
this function <laughs> would be a characterization of the shape. Well, this, this shape is somewhat tilted, so this function is somewhat tilted. And instead of storing all the data points here, we would say basically a characterization of what is going on here is this trend. And we have assumed that there was this linear trend or this linear model. But this is of course a ridiculous idea. But that does not really explain what is going on here. A better idea could be to, I don't know, look at something like this. So here is the shape again. And if we were able to, say, determine this curve, um, however we would do that, or however that curve would be parameterized, this is probably a better model of the shape. Do you agree? All right. And this is what I mean by a model can fit perfectly. If we assume this was, there was a linear relation here, then we can fit the linear model and we will find, you know, for instance, using the techniques we have been using so far, the perfect parameters for that model. But our model is stupid. All right. And um, if we had a better model, we might be able to fit that perfectly to the data. So in that sense, both these models are fitted perfectly to the data, but one of them gives a bad explanation. And this is extremely crucial. You have to be aware of that. Yeah? What is the measure of being a perfect fit? Uh, um, so far, it was minimum square error. Right. That you can, this, this is one measure of perfect fit. Well, we can think of, uh, I don't know, probabilistic divergence measures. And there are lots of measures we can use. Um, of course, yeah, we would have to agree on one, but you know, with respect to a certain definition of what is a good fit, we can fit. And then we find that, and our algorithm told us this is the best fit. But the model is not a good one. In this, in this problem that we are having on the left side, yeah. this model is not capable actually to represent this function that we are trying to model. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, this is the problem. This, this is what I want to, what I want to say. Like, what, what is this actually? We don't know, right? And when we looked at the um, illumination in those images, we don't know. We, we really don't know what was the illumination function when the image was taken. We don't know that. And so we, we know, said, no, well, let's assume it was linear, okay, as we did here. And then we used an algorithm to determine the best parameters of our linear model, and it gave us certain parameters. And we then might be tempted to say, yay, we have found the perfect fit, which we did. But still, the idea we started out with, let's assume it was linear, might be utterly wrong, right? Maybe confused by perfectly fit, maybe the overfitting that happens in machine learning. That yeah. We are yeah, this, yeah, this is of course uh, also an instance of um, um, a model may fit perfectly. Right? But what I wanted to stress here, and this is, I don't know, can't stress it enough, you must be careful because um, at least to my mind in computer science there is this tendency to, to always only think in terms of algorithms, right? In terms of, okay, so we, we, we want to minimize the squared error. And uh, like if the function is linear, then those are the best parameters. Done, we are done, we have found the perfect model. We have not, right? We have, we have run an algorithm that did the best it could to fit a model that might be useless or not you know, as good as it could be. And this is something you have to be aware of. So. Um, don't let yourselves be fooled in, in terms of how people um, always say, oh, okay, this is the best fit we got. There could be something better, but they you know, didn't think of it. And um, I have another example. 
Um, here's another one. Okay. So let's look at, I don't know, something like this, some time series, bang. Okay. And I'll, so here is the same picture. This is supposed to be the same picture again. They may look different, but you know, get the, the point. So we could fit a model, like say this, this is the data we are given. This time, say with respect to time, some development over time, stock market, say. And then we may fit a model, I don't know, like this, whatever say it's exponential growth. Or, I don't know, we could say it's some, some form of a triangle function. Which one is better? Yeah. Is that so? <laughs> we don't even know. Right? We don't even know. So it is, is definitely, you know, a really good fit for the first two thirds of, of the data we are given, but it, it performs poorly on the last third. Uh, this one is not, it's, it's actually, you know, it's not really so close to the data, but at least it captures the crucial fact that something strange happens here. Right. And um, this is, this is to say, let me point that out and I'll get back to this example. So sometimes, sometimes uh, there's not enough data. There is not enough data um, or information, I'll use those terms, Locking the changes here to allow to allow for a good model. A good model. And um, this is this is something that was pointed out by the great mathematician and philosopher uh, Bertrand Russell. And I have chosen these two curves, or like the, the, the black curves, um, with a purpose. He had the example of a turkey, you know, the kind of bird the Americans like to eat at Thanksgiving. At some point, I don't know, the turkey hatches from the egg and is being fed food. And eventually, you know, brain develops, turkey realizes the older I get, the more food I get. And the night before Thanksgiving, the turkey predicts, given the data he had seen so far, tomorrow I will get that amount of food. But no. You have to be aware of that. Right? When, when you must be careful what I tell you. When I say, let's, let's assume there's a bilinear... If, why? I throw these things in front of you, you know, because they are conveniently to be estimated. But do they really make sense? I don't know. Right? Of course, um, I don't throw stuff in front of you that does not make sense whatsoever. No sense at all. I'm trying to provide you with examples and experience, you know, you could use later on in life. But you really have to be um, fully aware of what we are actually doing when we do all these model fitting exercises, we are walking on very thin ice, very thin ice. And the fact that after we have run an algorithm and it has converged and has thrown out a number of parameters and they are the best parameters under the um, error function we, we are considering, does not necessarily mean that what we did was really the best we could have done. All right. So that, um, I had to get rid of that. You have to be aware of this. That means there is no any algorithm who can fit to our situation? No. <laughs> no, there is not. There is not. There is really not. And I know it hurts. 
um, because in, in your studies so far, you may have been led to believe that whatever you learn here are the perfect answers to everything. And I would say up until the bachelor uh, level, that's, that's indeed true. But out in real life, we are typically dealing with situations where we do not have perfect answers, but a good toolbox. Right? And we know that, you know, this, this idea of model fitting, it makes sense. And of course, you know, once more information comes in, we can adapt the model and so on and so forth. But um, think of it. Why? There's no, like, why doesn't everybody be a billionaire from trading stock? If we could perfectly predict the development of the stock market, then, you know, we could all be very rich or, you know, all have the same amount of, of wealth. Um, it appears that this is one of the situations where we don't have enough data. If, if we knew everything, we might be able to predict the stock market for the next 100 years. Uh, but we can't do that. Out in real life, things are more complicated than, than we would like them to be. And all we can do here is really familiarize us with at least the best we can do under all this uncertainty. All right? You have to be aware of that. That the stuff you are learning here are not the final answers. They are good ideas as to what to do, but from now on, it's very unlikely that there are perfect answers to everything. All right, great. So that was um, an important thing to, I don't know, point out, because it's, it's hardly ever made explicit in, in, in the books you might read. It's hardly ever made explicit or pointed out, but if you know it, you know that you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Now, um, we'll go back to our binary image um, analysis problem. And uh, in fact, before we do that, I'll have to throw yet more concepts from uh, statistics in front of you. And the topic we will study for the next couple of minutes is called moments. Uh, what are statistical moments? Do you know? Anybody any idea? See, there we go. It's good that I do it. Uh, <laughs> because otherwise the next, uh, next section would be a bit of uh, a torture. All right. Um, given a function g of x and y, such as we saw when we looked into these binary images, uh, we consider the following funny thing. I will call it M with two subscripts, P and Q, and I define it as a double integral, x raised to the power of P, y raised to the power of q, g of x and y, and we integrate that with respect to x and y. This is for the continuous case, that is to say when the function g of x and y we are considering is continuous. Um, for our intents and purposes when we implement these kind of things on computers, G is typically discrete, right, because digital computer. So there we would then define this notion of the moment P and Q as uh, the double sum, sum over all X we are given, sum over all Y we are given, other than then X to the P, Y to the P, G of X and Y. These two things are called moments. And we'll look into what that means in a second. Here is how we would compute them if the function we are given is continuous. And here is the discrete equivalent. And um, I'll 
have a window here just to probably avoid some confusion. So these moments are defined or can be defined, I'll say are defined for any function, any function that is not just uh, the indicator functions. Indicator functions as in as in binary image processing. So even though uh, I started out today with a function g of x that was indicating or representing a binary image and I'm using this g of x again. Uh, please do not think that this only works for uh, indicator functions g. Right? This, this would work for any kind of function but of course our main interest is indeed in indicator functions. And um, yeah because there's still space here. <laughs> I use it. Um, we say that a moment, the moment is of order P plus Q. So this is actually the definition. All right, again, uh, this does not say anything so far. It's a very abstract concept. So let's fill it with life and look at examples. All right. Examples will at the beginning deal with binary images. So we have a couple of examples for binary images. And we may be interested in computing the area of a shape, which is to say the total number of pixels, foreground pixels, okay? So for our case right now, we are interested, given a binary image, given all the pixels, the black ones, the foreground pixels, how many are there? What is the area of the shape? We can use a moment to determine that, namely, the moment m not not, which according to our definition is just the sum over x and y, g of x and y. Can we all agree on that? Right, I said this g is a function uh, that assumes a value of 1 if it's a foreground pixel and it's a value of 0 if it's a background pixel, x and y are the coordinates. If this g is 0 and we add it to something, nothing happens. But if it is 1, it will increase the count of pixels we have so far by 1. So this 0, 0 moment indeed counts the number of pixels, foreground pixels, right? Which we can say is the size or area of the shape. Here is another one. And if we look at that one, everything will probably fall into place. What about the center, center of mass of such a binary image? Well, this is um, a two-dimensional object, right? We have all these um, 2D points where either we have all the pixels, some of them are foreground pixels and therefore black, or some of them are background pixels and therefore white, or, and we already said, can be uh, just as well be conceptualized as a set of points, 
So now I'm saying we have all we have a set of points, and we ask for sort of the center point of the points we are given. And if those points are two-dimensional, then the center point is a two-dimensional point as well. So it has an x and a y coordinate. And I will refer to the x coordinate as x bar. And uh, think of it, this is given as the moment m10 over m0. And the y coordinate is given as the moment m01 over m00. Why would that be? Now, this one here, m1, m1, would simply sort of add all the x coordinates together because the g is, is always 1 or 0, so it would, you know, this one will add all the x coordinates together. And then if we divide it by the total number of points, we get the x average. This one will add all the y coordinates, and if we divide it by the total number of points, we get the y average, center of mass, center point. And of course, another name uh, for this thing is um, vector mu. Right? This is something we have studied quite extensively, or at least reminded ourselves about. So this is a two-dimensional vector consisting of x bar and y bar. This is the mean, the mean point of the shape. Uh -huh. It appears that these crazy um, definitions I have thrown in front of you as to what it is when we talk about the moment have something to do with statistics. Right? Let's, let's look at that some more. But before we do that, we um, need yet another concept, namely the idea of central moments. Um, and you know, this is again defined for continuous and discrete functions, but let's just uh, look at the discrete case. Um, you can generalize this uh, for yourself for um, discrete discrete g of x and y we define and now I'm calling it mu p and q that's probably a bit more emphasized here so mu instead of m and this is the sum over all the x and y and now we have x minus x bar raised to the power of p and y minus y bar raised to the power of q times g of x and y and the integral um, expression is, is corresponding here. I have not written it down. And here is one thing I note. I'm basically throwing a lot of uh, terminology in front of you. Central moments. Central moments are translation invariant. Translation invariant. And by that I mean, again, with respect to, say, shape, it doesn't matter where the shape is located within an image. If we compute its central moments, they will all be the same regardless of the position of the shape within the image. Okay, um, I sneaked it in, like in passing, that this first order moment uh, has something to do with the mean of, in our case, a two-dimensional uh, collection of points. Uh, then, um, sure, can we take it any further? What about, say, variance? Uh, they, uh, which central moments are we also sure that they are also independent of orientation of shape? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that we are. Um, so, 
I don't know. Let's say we have one shape over here, right? And I don't know, one over here. And then let me, I don't know, try to rotate it a bit. The center point you know, should, should always be the center point. And uh, then if we begin to compute um, moments with respect to the center point, this should be good. Because it doesn't make like a play uh, of course, this one will have a different uh, variance uh, than the others, but it doesn't make a difference as to where it's located. And it's, it, it does not, it is not invariant with respect to uh, rotation, but it is invariant with respect to location. And invariance with respect to location is called translation invariance. So we um, spent quite some time on either reminding ourselves uh, of the notion of variance or um, familiarizing ourselves with it. Uh, get this, variance can be understood as the second order central moment. Second order central moments. I'll just write it down and, and you see. So M the mu to naught is the sum over x and y, and then we have x minus x bar squared g of x and y. Where is the expression with respect to y? Where has that one gone? Okay. So we would expect that there should be something like y minus y bar something and then g of x and y. And it's not there, I dropped it. Why is that? Because this thing is raised to the power of zero which is to say that this is one. Right, so the second order, this, the, the order of this thing is two plus zero. Second order, central moment with respect to x, first one is two, is actually the variance along the x direction. We see that, right? I removed this one here so that we can see it more clearly. Variance along the x direction, I mean. Get this one back here. Y. And of course, same would hold for the y direction. Uh, sum over x and y, y minus y bar squared g of x and y. Okay. Some, some uh, terminology in mathematics. This is called variance, and we talk about it. And in physics, this has the name of moment of inertia. And I guess that is where this name comes from. I'm not really sure, but why would these, uh, these functions be called moments? Maybe it is because of their origin in certain physical problems. Um, is there another second order moment? moment? Yeah. Where is it? Why don't I have talked about it yet? Well, I have to, and, and so therefore... Go for it. Um, I point out the following. Uh, again, for everything I'm talking about today, in my mind I have this picture of a set of two-dimensional points, which we can visualize as a binary shape. Right? So like lots of, a set of 2D points. And therefore when I say point spread, that is the average distance to the average 
point. Various. Uh, this may not be aligned, be aligned with the coordinate axes. With the coordinate axes, and so therefore there is this mixed term. There is, and we also have. This mixed term mu one one, which is the sum over all the x and y, now x minus x bar, x bar times y minus y bar times g of x and y. I, I'm dropping the exponent of 1 here, that is okay, I guess. Maybe I should put it in just for, to be safe, right? This is why this is called mu 1, 1. And again, this is something we have seen earlier. This is uh, in mathematics, math, they call it covariance. Variance or coefficient variance. Should not have said this anyway. Is a concept we have seen. Interesting. It's a very, if you think of it, a very simple um, definition. This this formula for a moment or a central moment. We say, uh, in the case of central moments, we have mu, p, and q, and then we have a sum over all the x and y coordinates we are given, something raised to the power of p times something raised to the power of q times, say, the indicator function we're dealing with. And it turns out that depending on how we choose the p and q, all these things we studied earlier pop out. All right. Well, we can take this further. What, like, I mean, what about third order moments? Hmm? Would that make sense? Is that you know? Is that something that merits study? Well, let me tell you, it does. Here's another concept from statistics. It's called skew. Um, this has to do with third order central moments. Moment. And of course, there are many of those. Um, mu 3 naught, mu naught 3, and then mu 2 1, and mu 1 2. Well, not so many, it's not that many, but you know, all these are third order central moments because 3 plus 0 is 3, 2 plus 1 is 3, so there we go. Um, we can compute this and this is a measure, measure, or it measures if points are spread evenly evenly around or about about the mean or if they trail off or if they trail off tail off tail off to the right to the right or left Again, this is uh, something that is easily illustrated. Let me do it in this window here. Um, and let me, for the sake of simplicity, consider a function of just one variable because if I would have to draw skewed distributions over two variables, that uh, 
dangerous. But, you know, if it's just one variable, you can still compute the third order moment of that variable. So no problem. Um, when I say spread evenly about the mean, I need three examples. X. So evenly about the mean would probably, I don't know, you, nah. I use X bar, it's safer today. X bar. So I don't know, the Gaussian is something like that. Ah, this is of course not, totally not. So this is supposed to be a bell-shaped curve, right? This thing would have no skew. If we were to compute the third order moment, it would evaluate to zero. Um, the curve may look like this, or it may look like this, I'll draw the other one. And here we actually say it is skewed, skewed, to the right and here skewed to the left. Yeah. And um, of course we can plot these kind of functions and then we see if they are skewed or not. Uh, but we could also compute the third order moment and uh, depending on a zero larger than zero or less than zero, it would tell us about the skew. This is in the case of one-dimensional variables uh, almost um, overkill, but of course, if we were to compute these things with respect to higher dimensional functions, then uh, it's more difficult to plot those. Okay, um, we are almost done. I wanted to point out yet another one. This one is called kurtosis. Kurtosis. And uh, this has to do with the fourth order central moments. Now, this time there are really many, so for instance, M4 naught, M naught 4. M three one, M two two, and I a couple of them. Uh, this is an interesting statistic. And uh, remember that I told you that a statistic is a measure of a certain property that somehow captures a behavior in terms of one number. So this statistic, the kurtosis, measures or is a measure measure of the flatness, flatness of the tail um, of a distribution, distribution, and then we have to understand this with respect to uh, a Gaussian Gaussian, uh, where the kurtosis, kurtosis is zero. So for the Gaussian, all the higher order moments are zero. It has a mean, it has a variance, and nothing else. It has no skew, it has no kurtosis, it has, and there are more, I mean, like we can continue this up to infinity, right? Um, now, what would that mean? Um, here is another picture which says a thousand words. And again, for the sake of simplicity, I'll consider just one variable. Uh, here is the one example, and here is the other. Uh, function may look like, like so. I don't know, like so. Or like so. Can we agree that they 
behave rather differently. Yeah. So this this one basically drops off to zero fairly at some finite interval, and this one will probably continue to all infinity and never really actually reach zero quickly. Uh, this one here is called a Plati. Uh, I'm just being wrong. Plati Kurtic. Plati Kurtic. And this one here is called Lapto Kurtic. Lapto Kurtic. These are all Greek words. Uh, this has negative kurtosis. Negative kurtosis. And this one has positive kurtosis. And now you have learned something. This is, yeah, you know. <laughs> See it like this. Uh, the, the, the last two ones, like skew and kurtosis, uh, very, very, very likely will not appear again throughout our lecture series. And still, you now at least know what it means to say this is a skewed distribution and there's certain kurtosis measure. And these things may pop up if you read something, I don't know, for whatever purpose. And, um, you know, my, my job is to educate you. So here you go. Now you know about skew and kurtosis, which, as it so happened, popped out of this general idea of the moment. Right? And there are first, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever order moments we can compute as many moments as we like. And we saw that this idea of a moment, or in particular the idea of a central moment, seems to comprise or generalize all the things we have studied about means and variance so far. Right? We can generalize that. We have now a very general tool in our arsenal. Okay, and now, um, how much time do we have left? Let me see. It's too too early to call it quits, so let's. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's go back. I'll, I'll do it like this. I knew that this was bound to happen because there was lots of different stuff I wanted to tell you about. And actually lots of important stuff. But, uh, so, um, remember that I said an interesting problem to ask or question to ask and problem to study is if we are given a set of points which, as it so happens, look like the shape of a horse, all right? But from now on, we may think of this as just a collection of points. In our case, those are 2D points. And uh, they live in a certain coordinate system. This is somehow they have been measured. Right? Let's say a picture has been taken and binarized and the camera was positioned somehow and the object was positioned somehow and depending on the camera position we have fixed a coordinate system and now the set of points lives in this coordinate system and it is somewhat shifted and rotated and not it is not in a in an orientation and location we would say this is mm, invariant with respect to the shape the question we could ask is, can we come up with a coordinate system that is produced 
by the points themselves. But this, this coordinate system sort of that represents the camera coordinate system is something the object or the points have no control over. But is there something I would say, hmm, the set of points themselves, the set of points themselves would provide us with a way of talking about the points. Who knows what I'm after here? Okay. Um, it's good that you don't answer that question because otherwise it would be very boring for the next two lectures. <laughs> I have already indicated such a coordinate system. And in the last semester, we spent quite some time on talking about transformations between coordinate systems. And um, I have not told you where those coordinates come from yet. But of course, we know that if we had them, that is, if we had an origin and the directions of the two coordinate axes, we could change our point of view from like, you know, looking on like this by uh, first moving our point of view to the center of that and then rotate our point of view correspondingly. And if we do that, we see the horse like this. Right? This is what we spent a lot of time on in the first course on this lecture, in this lecture series. And we will now begin to study how to get this particular coordinate system. And um, in order to study that, there are many different ways of how we can do this. And it is no lie if I tell you that what we will do in the next two to three to four, I don't even know yet, lectures is by far the most important thing we do throughout this semester. If you can wrap your head around that, you're good. You have learned something profound. What you will be learning is the question, how can we get this local coordinate system that is in a sense defined by the data itself? And we'll look at it, first of all, from the perspective of physics. Once we have done that, we will take it into more mathematical realms and, and look at different derivation of how to get this coordinate system. And when I say we first look at it from the point of view of physics, what I'm interested in is to determine the axis of maximum inertia of that set of points. All right. And um, maybe you take a sketch of this figure. <laughs> Just then I don't have to show it again next time. Uh, we can start right away. So what we see here is a set of points. It's, it's sort of a continuous set of points now. It's not a discrete binary image, but I have created some set of points and it is shown in terms of these gray shaded two circles, whatever. It's, it's, it's a two-dimensional collection of, it's a collection of two-dimensional points. I have already indicated the axis of maximum inertia here. It is this orange line. And the direction of this axis can be indicated by a vector d. I don't know for direction. And that vector d encloses an angle of theta with the x-axis. I have also indicated a point P on this line and this point is actually the point, the closest point on the line to the origin. 
this is the point that is closest to the origin because this line segment here is, is perpendicular. And the length of this line segment is called rho, Greek letter rho. And here the angle theta reappears. And finally, there are two points. One is called x0, is another point on the line. And one is called x, which is one of the many, many points living in this gray area here. And the distance between x and x0, where x0 is the closest point on the line to x, is called r. Okay. So that is um, a lot of variables, which I will be losing, using next time. And our question is, um, is there a way for us to compute r? That is what we're going to, to look into. Once we have found an analytic expression for R, we will then ask for, okay, so what about all the points for which R is zero? And uh, those are, of course, the points along the line. And once we have reached that solution, another analytic expression for the points along these lines. Uh, this particular line, we can then again look into an optimization procedure uh, that would determine um, the optimal line. That would us, uh, tell us uh, optimal theta and rho to describe this line. This is, uh, this is our menu for next time. It doesn't really, I'm sorry, it doesn't make any sense to start that right now. It's too, too much, too much stuff to write down. Okay, so let's call it quit at this point, which is probably actually good because of the next uh, lectures about to start. Are there any questions regarding what we did today? Like binary images and moments? No, great. Then we see each other again later this afternoon or uh, when is it? One o'clock? One thirty? I don't know. One thirty? Or one? One o'clock. All right. It's here, right? In in, in this room. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, we'll we'll see you again <laughs> at one o'clock. See you then. Thanks.